welcome to another uh, uh, episode or uh, segment of uh, Poets in Montana. And today, I, uh, my guest over here is uh, David Allen Cates, who, uh, if you are familiar with Montana writers, you know are most familiar with his work as a fiction writer, uh, five novels, I think, and, uh, and, and a book of short stories out this year also with the, yeah. with the collection of poems. But we're going to talk about poems today or whatever, whatever Dave wants to talk about. <laughs> and uh, the books that, uh, that he does have out, uh, this little tiny book, this is a, I love little books like this. Me too. It's like yes, a pocket I book, the city lights yeah. type of size. Yeah. And uh, the mysterious location of Kyrgyzstan was what year? 2016. 2016. Oh, pivotal year. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then this book, uh, the one that uh, we'll probably read from today, Valentine's Day in the Mummy Museum, which came out last year. So uh, Dave showed up here, I think, in the early 70s or so. 74. 70s, 74. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, so, uh, you, did you go through the writing program in '74? No, I came as an undergraduate, and and I uh, graduated in '79, and then I came back ten years later for the writing program in '89. Okay, okay. Yeah. In the meantime, we were raising cattle on my dad's farm, or living in Central America. I did both of those in those ten years, and so and writing. I was always writing, and I came back to learn what I hadn't learned on my own. Yeah, yeah, and uh, what year was Hunger in America published? 92. Okay, okay, so I, so I did that, uh, that makes sense now, because I uh, I'm trying to, was trying to think of when we first met, uh, mm -hmm. or when I first became acquainted with you, and it was through your book. Uh -huh. That's when I first became acquainted with you, yeah. and kind of through Pete Fromm. Uh -huh. Because he was living in Great Falls, and I was over in Augusta, and and I I he'd told me about you because mm -hmm. you guys were uh, undergraduate friends. Is that yes. right? Or, yeah. Yeah, we were we were. Uh, Pete was a couple years b behind me, and we had a lot of mutual friends together. I, we didn't know each other that well as undergrads, but um, uh, but we knew of each other, and we became really well acquainted when I moved back in 89 to mm -hmm. go to grad school. He was over in Great Falls and came over and with other mutual friends helped us move in, into family housing apartment. We went on the river a couple days later and and um, I, I had a, uh, in, in 1988 I came out here uh, with my wife, her family lives in Montana Folks were in Helena, and uh, her da her youngest sister was graduating from law school, mm -hmm. and uh, so we came over for Martha's graduation to Missoula, and a bunch of old friends, college friends, gathered down at uh, the Union Club, mm -hmm. and Pete was there, and I sat next to Pete at the bar and said, uh, "What have you been doing?" He says, "Well, I've been working." Uh, for the uh, for the uh, park service and writing, and I I didn't know that, and mm -hmm. I had been raising cattle and writing. So we said, well, let's start sending each other stories back and forth and getting and helping each other. So I went back to the farm, and over the next year was exchanging stories with Pete. And then when I moved out, we kind of felt like we knew each other. Yeah, and then by the, the, the chance of the writing gods published our first books the same time and did some tours together. So that's when we became oh, cool. good friends. Cool. So that Indian Creek Chronicles was the same time roughly as your that that no the uh, his first book was a book of short stories and Indian oh, Creek yeah, Chronicles yeah, was yeah, the yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so it was a, a book of short stories uh, the name of which I'm forgetting right now but um, we did a tour on the west coast and um, uh, then uh, we did a little tour through Hellgate Writers around Montana okay. with Judy Blunt. And, okay. uh, oh my God, that was one hell of a fun time. <laughs> seven, seven readings in seven days from Glasgow to uh, Malta, uh, all the way to Whitefish, and Great Falls, Yellow Bay, 
And I remember pulling in at the end of that trip and thinking, I don't know if I will ever have a, as much fun in a week as I just had. <laughs> There's something really fun about driving with Judy, Pete, and I. Oh my gosh, should we laugh? We would read in the evenings to scattered crowds, you know, depend on where we were. Right. And uh, Pete was reading from Indian Creek Chronicles. He he, that book was going to come out and which was very funny. It was a greenhorn in the mountains book. Right. It is. And right. and uh, everybody loves a greenhorn in the mountains Especially story. Especially on the high line, you know. And, <laughs> and then Judy was reading these sad essays about leaving the ranch. Yeah. And I was reading these this uh, parts of hunger in America, which takes place in one night in Kodiak, Alaska, and it's uh, a night story full of some mm. sad and and dirty. I don't know if it's any sexual dirty, but like it's gritty. It's, it's yeah. and and yeah. and afterward, there'd be a line of people to talk to Pete and Judy to share their experiences about the ranch or up in the mountains and nobody in front of me. And Pete and Judy and I used to, <laughs> then we'd go drink beer and Pete and, <laughs> and Pete and Judy and I would say, oh yeah, Judy, Pete makes them laugh, Judy makes them cry, Dave makes them a little bit nauseated. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> so it was just... And, and, and reticent about ever moving to Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a fun trip. But anyway, that's, that's how we became friends. Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I read that book and I, I just, I couldn't hardly believe it, actually. I think that's a great book. I just think it's a fantastic book. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and then after that, uh, we wound up, you know, eventually almost six, seven years later, moving back down here, and then, boom, I guess through the collaborative, probably. Through the collaborative, I believe. And, and, then, and then Anna is yep. this, is, uh, you know, my, my son's Sean's age. So, yeah, so anyway, um, what else uh, in terms of your, your, your biographical data do we need to cover? You are honored, you're an award-winning uh, writer, and uh, I thought it was interesting, the, uh, the shift uh, that you made to uh, to poetry when you especially when you did it and after the fact it didn't seem odd to me at all but at the time it's it seemed odd mm -hmm. that, that that you that you made that move uh, yeah I, I uh, always wanted to write novels and and I wrote stories and novels I, that's that's what moved me to want to write was these beautiful things, novels that I was encountering, and um, and stories. I, I always read poetry, <clears throat> and uh, and I always considered the rhythm of my sentences extremely important as I was writing po poems. Rhythm, rhythm, rhythm was everything to me. Uh, the 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 feel, the beat of the of the language through the paragraph. I spent. In my early years writing, you know, I'd get, wake up in the morning and I didn't have a project. I wasn't on a novel or something, but I would write paragraphs. And I mean, I probably spent a couple of years just writing paragraphs. And that sounds really strange now, but um, they were probably like prose poems. I was going to say, that's like a prose poet, but, um, basically. Yeah. They, the, 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 the language and complexity of the, of the paragraph entering into the paragraph one place, coming out another place, um, each sentence being unexpected um, uh, that that I, I was enthralled with language in that at that level as a prose writer and so the, the move to poetry was was it wasn't like I was uh, unacquainted with poetry and it wasn't li like I I wasn't attuned to the the demands of poetry yeah. um, but you hadn't exactly tried to sit down and practice it for you know a lot prior to when you came out. But these no, it's very funny. I uh, <clears throat> we it was ten years ago, and we were. Um, I was just thinking about this. 
it's almost 10 years ago. I had applied for a Fulbright twice to go to uh, Guanajuato, Mexico and work at the university there. And it's hard to get a Fulbright when you aren't, don't have an academic life. Mm -hmm. So I, I was denied it twice and I was essentially going, I wanted, I, there was a professor there that wanted me to do some work, but I was mainly going to write another novel. Mm -hmm. um, of which I did not know what it would be. Uh, I had finished a draft of uh, a few drafts of Tom Connor's Gift, and I thought, uh, and that was very um, difficult. And I thought, I think it's time to start a new novel. And and I go down there, and I remember I hadn't written in about six months. And when you hadn't writ written, when you haven't written for a while, and you start sit down again, you kind of feel a little out of practice. And and so I remember just kind of messing around with, with some poems, uh, with just putting lines and playing with language, you know, just playing and seeing mm -hmm. what happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote a few poems in that first week, and I, they, they amused me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this mm -hmm. is amusing, this is fun. And um, so I did it some more, and, and I just never got off it. I thought, uh, what, what the heck, you know, this is maybe I'll just write some more of these. This yeah. is fun and it's amusing and it takes my brain places and, and in a week uh, I feel like I did something, whereas when you write a novel a lot of times you can go months and you're working really hard but you have no clue if you have anything and so that was kind of fun. I was, um, and I, we spent six months in, in Guanajuato. Um, I just decided to go there even though they didn't give me the Fulbright. And, Mm -hmm. uh, my wife was working part-time online, and uh, it was cheap to live, and, um, and I just said, well, I'm just going to write poems. And, and uh, then, I, then I started, there's a poet in, in, in Guanajuato, and he was very encouraging when he saw some of my stuff, and uh, he said, you've got to start sending that out. And I did, and I started getting things published. Right. And I thought, this is easier than writing short stories for me. <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> and uh, and I thought, uh, yeah, I'll just I keep doing this. And 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 the idea of of picking up the heavy backpack of a novel and trudging for three or four years uh, was I, I just didn't have it in me. And and then I was doing rewrites of Tom Connor's Gift, which was very fatiguing. And um, so I just kept kept doing it. And uh, that's kind of uh, how. Um, I was, I think I, p I put some poems on Facebook and uh, uh, somebody saw one of the poems and offered to publish that chat book. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that was easy. It was like, holy smokes, you know, I'm used to right. submitting a book 25 times. And right. So then I suddenly have a chat book of poetry. Then I think, well, I want to make a collection. I'm going to keep at this for a few more years and um, till I have enough poems, enough good poems. I had a lot of bad poems, but... Uh, yeah. Good poems to make a collection, and so uh, I just um, just worked for that. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, no, I, 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 you know, when I uh, before I'm going to ask you to read here before we just babble on forever. But uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you know when I think about uh, uh, try, trying to write something bigger than poems, it's just, I, I become overwhelmed and I've jumped in and tried to do it a few times and I just get, I'm lazy. I'm just, I'm not <laughs> disciplined. I mean, I always, I always thought you guys were so disciplined. Fiction writers, you know what I mean? They were successful at it. We're just like, wow, and they stick with it and they, God almighty, and they're out there in the nowhere for a year. And, and, uh, and like you say, poetry, it's just basically fun and you get something done. And of course I was, I had other jobs too where I was, they were eating up a lot of hours in the day and so you didn't have, yeah. I mean, or it takes organization to write a goddamn novel, you know? No, it takes a lot of organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. People, you know, it's funny, people assume that if you are an artist, <laughs> That you have, I don't even, can't even keep track of which brain is which, but that you're a one. Yeah. But it's like no, to write a novel takes a lot of administrative and organizational <laughs> skills. I mean, you have to be able to hold a lot of things in your head and 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 weigh the proportions and play with the the balance and proportion and and have a sense of of uh, organization that that um, is that, that that it requires to create something with the complexity and form that a novel is. Right. 
And then it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of the capacity to be in uncertainty uh, and, and doubt and, and be okay with that for a year, two years, three years. And, and by nature, uh, that 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 was something that that I think I was g given, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If somebody said, "What was your what inborn thing did you have that allow you to write novels?" I think partly that was it, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I, to not, I didn't need to have the patience. answer or the yeah. yeah. I get, you, it, patience is a virtue, and I don't know how much patience I have, but I sure had the capacity to be okay with being confused and and for a long period of time and mm -hmm. so that uh, mm -hmm. and and uncertain so wait for it to develop um, well anyway. re re read something re re let, let's read something and uh, go ahead and I'll let you choose something to read to begin with and well I will read because I mentioned it uh, the poem that that I put on Facebook that asked that, that, that got the woman to publish that first chapbook of mine right it made me think, wow, this is, this is easier than I thought, <laughs> this publishing. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you, my first novel went to 43 publishers. Yeah. And then I sent out, gosh, 200 full prose manuscripts before my second novel was published. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, I've, I have, everybody's got horror stories, I have more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, and, okay, so this, this is actually what the, what the chapbook is called, The Mysterious Location of Kyrgyzstan. Who? Some people fall in love only once, and some never, and some like Elizabeth Taylor or my great aunt Edna with a parade of lovers. A woodcutter to whom she whispered into his sawdust beard, I'm a plant and your kiss is the rain. A dough-handed baker whose warm bread made her cry. A merchant marine with a tattooed belly who woke nightly trembling and gasping into her ear. And some fall in love with the same person over and over for decades and each time say the same common sacred things. What? The workers at the post office in Addis Ababa can't take my daughter's letter to her friend in Kyrgyzstan because they say they don't know where that country is. She shows them a map, but still they shake their heads. When? In the morning with coffee and the evening under a half moon and when we're born and when we wake in the middle of the night and don't know where we are. When the bus drops us off where two dirt roads cross in the jungle and it rains and we sing until the bus finally comes and we climb wet and steaming through the door and settle on top of our bags and sleep. When we get where we're going and before we get there, when we're hungry and thirsty and tired and can't sleep, and we look down and see dolphins next to the boat, or the light in the water the color of sky past snow-covered fur. When we see our children born and our parents die, and we lay the ashes of a child in a grave and later laugh and look at beautiful women and eat dessert. When the beer is gone and the band is finished playing and we walk home through a maze of alleys and up and down a thousand stairs to lie finally in our beds and listen to the breath of a buffalo outside our tent or our window or the voice of a dead boy or the wind, the unending wind. Where? After pointing to the closest trotting street dog and asking the closest person where that dog is going, hundreds of times in various Honduran towns during a six-year research period, and never getting another answer other than a shrug, 
My scientist brother concludes that nobody knows where the Honduran street dogs are going. Why? Because our lovers are strong and kind, and because they are cruel and weak, and because we are everything they are, including jealous and thrilled and disgusted and scared. And when we love, we feel all those things and also happy and sad. But despite our confusion, we know why we suffer, why we die, why we eat and sleep and why we wake and what we mean when we say the common, sacred things we say. That's wonderful, man. I, I, uh, <clears throat> it's full of so much that, uh, that a poem can be full of. I mean, and it, and it is definitely a poem, you know, I mean, it's, uh, but it's, but it's, you know, I can hear when I, when I read that poem again here just yesterday or whatever, I read it, uh, I was, I was very much, you know, thought about, well, this is, this is definitely, this is Dave, this is, this mm -hmm. is a storyteller in mm -hmm. action, but it's a, but it's such of a, a, a because poetry allows you to do whatever the hell yeah. you might want to do and jump yeah. around and, and, and you can be funny and you can be serious, you can be profound and you can be contradictory and you can, and, and, and then the craft, the whole structure of the thing that you mm -hmm. put to it. Was that fun? I'm the a journalism thing? major. <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> Who, what, when, where, why? <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, <laughs> oh yeah. No, no, no it's it's it, you know. As I haven't written much in the last last year or so, and I, I I'm at a place in my life where um, I, language, like I'm seeing language differently. There's a um, you know, there's there's life. There's the world, it, which is mysterious and unknowable, and and we we're always making desperate efforts to like put it into little understandable boxes. You know, we have a theory that explains history, a theory that explains injustice, a, a theory that explains what love. Put love in a box and history in a box and and um, um, injustice in a box, and 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 and, and we. We come up with language to kind of try to hold this thing that's that's bigger than our our ability to comprehend. But if we can put words on it, then we can kind of comprehend it. And and I have grown a little disgusted with language and the and the and the way that we we grab a bunch of words and throw them at the wall, and then we go oh. By that that's it, and then we then we arrange the world so it fits in with our language, uh, with our theory, mm -hmm. and and we begin to interpret events according to the theory. And yet the theory was made in order to try to interpret the un the unknowable, right. not the other way around. And right. and I don't even know what words to use anymore. I find I don't believe. Uh, we it would just be a gross overstatement to say I don't believe in words. I I read. Thousands of words a day, and I and but but I I have come to a place in my life where if I write again, if I write more, I feel like I have to invent a new language. I I don't, you know, I, we speak English, so we throw English words at the wall, and we, and the English words are are phrased to to contain something, and yet if we spoke another language, we'd throw those words at the wall, and 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 we'd understand it differently, and. Um, uh, I, I've been reading a lot of poetry in Spanish, and uh, I, I'm fluent in Spanish, and, and have used it a lot in my work as a, uh, with Missoula Medical Aid. And right. I don't, uh, I don't know uh, uh, where all this is leading, and may lead nowhere. But uh, as somebody who has uh, had um, a, put out great effort to try to. Um, evoke the mystery of being alive and evoke the mystery of, 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 of reality uh, through language uh, in a poem like that um, is 
I don't really know how to do it anymore in a way. Mm -hmm. I, I can, mm -hmm. I'm, my attempts seem <laughs> feeble and my, um, and my um, kind of, I feel like I have to invent a new language. I don't know if, I don't know what I'm gonna write next. I, I have this sense that uh, uh, I've tried a lot of ways. My novels are all different um, and I've written poetry and stories and, and uh, I'm, I read things that move me, but I don't know where to go next as a as yeah. a writer. Yeah. Um, and uh, but that poem is a, really an opening up for me and it's a sense of um, discovering the power of poetry to evoke un things that we can't quite name. And uh, I mean, if there is a ground for that kind of reentry to language for you again, I mean. Poetry is good ground for poetry because ground. because it's anything can happen in yeah. poetry yeah. and 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 I mean I've got <laughs> several friends uh, a couple that I hope to you know bring to the program that literally uh, uh, are, uh, believe that that language is incapable of communication and they go about trying to do that and it becomes you know this sort of game or mind-boggling journey through words that you're trying to to figure out uh, you know it's like yesterday I had these kids in this little class and I always I always start out you know with these uh, young fourth grade kids I usually start out because I blather for the first 20 minutes, you know, oh, look at me, I'm your poet, I'm here to teach, you know, and uh, do all that. So I have little time to fill the whole thing and get them to write and hear them read. So I usually do the acrostic thing, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the word that you can just stand down the page in all capital yeah. letters and see what falls out as a poem. And uh, one of the examples I've, I've used over and over again, I, a girl, a fourth grade girl wrote this in the in Franklin Elementary School, probably twenty plus years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, the title of her poem, I th I think I have this thing in my head. The title of her poem is "I Love Mathematics." Mm -hmm. That's a lot of lines. No kidding. Yeah, fourth grade girl, and, and she writes, "I love mathematics. Love is such an oval shaped word. Very." cool and electric to my body and it toasts the heat eating my body and my testy bones inside this circled system. Wow, a fourth grade girl wrote that thing. It's like, what the hell? And you read that to, to kids and they're just like, what? I know, <laughs> you know it's it, like, really, it, yeah, and it, and it, but I mean, it, it is. There's something very pleasing about it, and there's something very pleasing about the rhythm of it, and and you know when she wrote on one line, testy bones, I thought, yeah. oh my God, yeah, I'm gonna, st I have to steal that. How can I steal that <laughs> or whatever? It was just the you such just a, did. I know exactly. <laughs> it's just such of a great, great thing to say. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if there's any. Uh, venue uh, to try to to do something along those lines when you venture back out this is this is a good spot poetry yeah I you know I I'm trying to um, re-remember kind of uh, or or remind myself let's say I were a, a sculptor and let's say I worked in stone mm -hmm. okay or let's say I worked in metal mm -hmm and I made a metal sculpture. The metal is crucial as a tool to making something, but the metal is not the world, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the words are not the world. The, uh, the words are only there to try to evoke something that is bigger than the words. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my, uh, this place I'm at, and I'm trying to kind of hold this emptiness and and see if uh, anything comes in. And I'm not uh, impatient at all. I don't really care if I write anything else. In fact, I kind of hope I don't have to because it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I just go. I'm 65. People ask me if I'm retired. Why not? <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's call it that. <laughs> yeah, why not? You know, and uh, the writers don't really retire, but at the same time, uh, uh, every book I've written has been written from this place of, uh, of emptiness where and confusion, and then sometimes I'm forced to act on it, and sometimes I'm not. I've flipped off more of these ideas than I've ever in, indulged myself in. You know, right, yeah. right. You all, I, you, I, you remember you saying at one point. Uh, I've heard you say uh, on a, more than one occasion that uh, that. Uh, Writing for you, I guess, is is a way of trying to, you know, figure out what it means to be a human being. Yeah, and uh, that is the uh, the ultimate uh, question, I guess, that we all face yeah. if we if we want to think about you know anything at all. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and your work does that over and over again. I think, I you know, one of the things that that popped up in the in the uh, the Valentine's Day book over over the first little book I just loved that first little book I, I, yeah. I gobbled that thing up and and uh, and and then I, I picked up the the Valentines at the mummy museum again and and started into that and I thought oh yeah yeah then I remembered the poems that were in there the ones that you but that you'd written after that first collection and, and a lot of those are, are there's a lot of humor in them yeah. I mean at least to me they're humor well, I, I, so. I don't know <laughs> I know. I hope be. so. I mean, life <laughs> yeah. is funny. You yeah, know? exactly. Uh, and so, I mean, life is full of all that stuff. And I, I don't know. Uh, and you know, I guess words, words fall short. But uh, what else are you going to do in the time you have left? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, there's all kinds of things to do. But uh, yeah, you, you, you do good things with words. Read us another poem. Read, read us one of those long ones. Uh, uh, I, I, this section, when I got to the things we say section, it was like, whatever happened to them, and then what was the next one I read that was one of those longer poems, like the Kyrgyzstan poem, but uh, the oh, and then the couple's poem. What was that one? The one with... Uh, that that's uh, whatever happened to them. Ten couples we used yeah, to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Why don't you read that? That'd be. That's a. This is a, a t ten part poem. Uh, it's uh, what what hap what whatever happened to them. Ten couples we used to know. You know, when you're our age, you've known a lot of couples. Yeah, <laughs> you you you've lived with a lot of couples in your mind. <laughs> yeah, and and you see people's stories in the long. Yeah, it's one of the great things about getting old is, is the, that you see the long arc of people's lives and you see the long arc of uh, and and so this is a play on that in a sense. It's ten, it's whatever happened to them. Ten couples we used to know. One, he was embarrassed to be caught without candles on her birthday or matches. So he rubbed two sticks together to light himself on fire. She watched flames lick up his legs and higher to his neck and face and her cool hands touched his burning ones. And they lived for a moment like that. Two, like turtles on a log, they sat next to each other all season until one day she stepped forward and plopped into the pond and swam away. He watched her fade into the murk and grieved, for he'd never seen the bottoms of her feet before, and he couldn't yet imagine his life alone or how the log beneath him slope from the grassy bank down to touch both water and sky. Three. After he left her, he slid rings, he, no, after he left her, 
He slid women like rings over his penis, each large, then shrinking to make room for the next, until fever passed, his body faded like a clear idea, and only a smile-shaped string of plastic dolls connected one dark planet eye with the other. Four. Perhaps they never forgave each other for sneaking so close, but didn't they say, please, please, please? Didn't they tear off their clothes and jump each other? Or maybe they bumped heads and forgot how they began, bobbing at sea with voluptuous hope. Wind, lightning, big waves, fun. For soon they tired, searched for calm, stared across the endless water and thought about throwing each other overboard and how they used to be nice people. When the chaos got too much for her, this is five, when the chaos got too much for her, she sat on his head and absorbed him. For a while we heard shrieks between her thighs, but he quieted and she did too, her skin and bones drying to dust over the shape of a tiny man, fetal inside her. Six. He opened the old door and she followed him up stone ramps built centuries ago for horses and heroes. Around and around, breathless past slits like green eyes opening to olive groves farther and farther below. When the sky finally swept blue around the last corner, she saw over the rooftop terrace and a spread of land fuzzy with heat the distant line of the sea. He kissed her, climbed under the wall, paused, his skinny arms bird-like, and jumped. For the rest of her life, she watched him fall. Seven. The morning she told him, in too many words, why she was leaving, he disappeared into silence. Air filled his shirt and pants. His empty shoes looked particularly sad under the table. When she finally walked out, she left a paper bag with her heart in it. He was too afraid to look, and for a long time, hungry, while he finished his coffee, he was hoping it was scones. Eight. Because she was planted among split rocks and ashes, tended with winter and spite in the drafty rubble of the old church, her daisy grew iron-stemmed, spindly, and brave, oh, so brave toward the faintest flicker of sun. From the damp among peonies he watched, molted and, oh, so moved, only waited. Nine. When one plate of the earth's crusts slid under another, their pretty house crumbled. Covered in mud, they snarled and crawled into their own separate dark caves where they reinvented fire and sleep under fur. We hear they're happy now. 10. Dancers, they made themselves beautiful shapes and circled each other, touched and leaned until their bodies became one. A pretty bird fluttered down from the sky and landed on their shoulder. For as long as they could, they strained to hold still. But one of them moved and the other fell, and the bird flew away. 
Years later, they woke to hear feathers ruffling in the dark near their ears. Faces close, they kissed, for they knew it wouldn't stay. Thank you. I, uh, you, you know, the, uh, there's just a magic, there's a sense of sort of a magical realism that goes on in your work a lot. And uh, I mean, I remember it from the novels, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when I, after I thought about, you know, listening to you read from your novels in, at different times, uh, it didn't, afterwards I thought, well, this is, it, yeah, he's he obviously been writing prose poems for a long time, <laughs> novels of them, uh -huh. because you would read them out loud and they would sound like poems to me. Uh -huh. and, and part of that is that you're just a goddamn good reader, you know. Oh, I mean, I, I, it's, 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 it's a pleasure to listen to you read and for those images and, those, and that magic whatever happens to happen. Uh, and, and I was just going to say this because I had uh, I'd, I'd read something or heard something. My, my old pan listens to podcasts all the time. I don't know if I heard this or if I read it, but it had something to do with uh, uh, the idea that uh, language uh, is in the body. Language is a part of the body. Language is a physical thing, and it mm -hmm. so it has so the rhythm of the body. It's like you know the the it does, yeah. and and I wondered if uh, if that uh, I mean you were uh, you came here. I know this because a friend of mine played basketball with you years ago. Yeah. You came here on a basketball scholarship or just to play basketball or uh, no? I walked on, but you I walked on. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But but you're you're you've been playing basketball. All of your life and, and doing other a lot of physical things. Are you a dancer? No. Oh, I like to dance, but I'm not a dancer. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, is, so do you? Does that is language? Do you feel it in the body? Oh, I, mean, I don't think it's language unless it's in the body. Yeah, I, to yeah, me, yeah. The, the language that isn't in the body is is absolutely forgettable and yeah. and just has no meaning. Yeah, and right. uh, it's one of my issues with. So the way language is used so much now. It's just like, what the hell is that? Somebody yeah. will be talking about something and, and everybody's nodding and I go, and I'm just going, what, what did that mean? What does that yeah. word mean? What does that yeah. phrase mean? I, I know that everybody thinks they know what it means and I get right. kind of, but what is it, you know, so no, I, 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 unless it's anchored in, in um, body and earth, I, I have a hard time uh, with language, uh, right. it, it's not that way. And, um, that, that's part of my difficulty with, with, with poetry that doesn't ever find itself mm -hmm. to the to the body, or or, mm -hmm. or you don't you don't feel it uh, in the in the world. I mean, it, yeah. it it doesn't really. It can't speak to me. It's not like I don't think that there's. It's fine. I don't have a problem with it. It's just that I can't mm -hmm. quite relate to it or grasp yeah. it. You know. Yeah. Because I can't feel it, I can't dance with it. No, that's that's that is what po I mean. Po the thing about poetry as compared to prose is a work of prose exists in the imagination and it's taken in silently. It's a subversive art uh, because it's taken in privately. There's no uh, you don't have to react in a public way to a novel you're reading. You can react totally privately. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, it's subversive. It, it can be, uh, um, we don't have to show a public face in our response to it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, but it only, it exists totally in the imagination. And, and, but poetry is meant to, it has a shape on the page and it has a sound. And certainly prose has a sound in our minds, but poetry has a sound out loud. And so it's, it's multi-dimensional and it has this physical dimension of the shape on the page and a, and a sensory dimension with the sound of the words. And um, so it's more like sculpture to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's more uh, like natural language. Yeah. I mean, it's more like, you know, when you think about the fact that before anything was ever written down, this was passed on in the sure. body from person to person, sure. and it was orchestrated in this way, in a dramatic kind of a fashion to, to entertain. Yes, to, to the sound of my, my, my three-year-old grandson 
likes he likes to speak in kind of a rhyming nonsense and he uses his hands as a little <laughs> show but the words make no sense yeah and it is poetry yeah. in the sense that uh uh, that he's he the, there's a he, there's a rhyme and a rhythm to the nonsense he's speaking. He's doing it to uh, he's creating something for your amusement, right? And he mimics it with the movement of his hands, so he understands the physical nature of uh, the connection between body and sound. Right. It's really um, it's a natural it's, experience. Yeah, and it's <clears throat> it is. It is the essence of poetry, even yeah. though he's not yeah. saying any word you'd recognize. So. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I've, you know, heard some of those, like, old beat poets from the past doing that kind of nonsense yeah. stuff of just rhythm and, yeah. and dance and, you know, maybe with a gong or something like yeah. that. And, and initially, when I first saw it, I thought it was kind of wacky. Uh, but the, uh, I watched it two or three more times, and it, it kind of gets to you, and it, and it reminds you of song, you know, yeah. and that's what I love to, I actually kind of felt myself coming to poetry through the idea of song to begin with, you know, yeah. listening to people talking while music was playing, so. Well, that's a, it's, it's a good <coughs> example, too, because um, uh, if, you know, I have people in my family who say, I have your book of poems, but I don't understand what they mean. And, and I always say, uh, you don't have to. I said, you know, there's a lot of songs I know that I can't understand even what they're saying. Exactly. I don't know what the song means. You can make up your own lyrics. You enjoy it or you don't enjoy it. You know, it's not yeah. like yeah. it has to mean anything. And uh, right. <clears throat> it's about the, exper the experience of receiving and and that can be inhibited when a reader feels as though they should be figuring out what it means. Yeah. Um, and uh, hopefully it's evocative and uh, makes you think of something that you're in the great long tedium of the day you wouldn't have thought of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we our minds march along in little and little bordered trails and every now and then we encounter something maybe a poem that knocks us off the trail for a little bit and <laughs> and that's good for us and uh, uh <laughs> what else are you gonna do <laughs> right now i mean yeah and the it says though it's like um i don't like i said i'm not a trained dancer i've never danced it but one of the things i like about going to like a performative dance is you see human beings making shapes with their bodies that we don't normally make. Right. And it's like, it makes your brain do something different to see a body do something, or to, I would imagine to actually make that shape with your body and do those and, motions. And, it's just and, like it, it frees up your and, mind. And your brain yearns to follow that, doesn't yes, it? And we it all does. copycats yeah. in a way. I mean, you're, you, 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 yeah. you want to start doing the same kinds of things, yeah. you know? It's like, yeah. Well, I, I would, uh, we might have to do this again. Because, well, because I to. could bullshit with you forever, I think. I would love uh, to, yeah. Uh, and, but I, I think we're probably getting close to that time. And the fact of the matter is, I think we only listened to two poems. They were a couple long ones, but yeah. we want to probably hear more at some point. So we'll probably come back to a, a David Cates part two at some point. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us, and uh, thanks, Dave. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's fun, it's, it's fun talking to you. Yeah, it's, it's a ball listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time on Poets in Montana. Yeah, lifetime filled